Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the show. My name is Bree Noble. I'm excited to be with you today and also with Mary Alouette, uh, who also has the artist name of a lark, which I think are both so pretty. Um, I am excited to get to know some about her artist journey. We're going to touch on her experience with crowdfunding as well, because I love to make this super actionable for you guys about a particular strategy. But before we can do that, I want to, you know, really understand her artist journey. And um, I know she's she's lived on the East Coast. She's lived in New York. She's lived in L.A. You know, all the all the different uh, places that artists tend to, you know, try and and see what works for them as far as personality and um, the kind of gigs that they want and stuff. So we'll get into all of that. But Mary, if you could let us know, like, you know, how you got started in music, uh, what made you end up in New York City and how come now you're in LA? I'm really interested in your artist journey. Yeah, thank you so much for having me and hello to your audience. This is such a great community and I'm thrilled to be here. I started doing music 28 years ago professionally in musical theater through um, various uh, daycare centers, my parents got me into it. And then I did musical theater professionally. I grew up in Maryland outside of Washington, DC, did that and sang with the Washington Opera and then got into opera singing. I then became an opera singer and studied at the Schulich School of Music at McGill University in Montreal in Canada. Mm-hmm. And my opera took me to sing in Italy and Austria and you know Canada. And I'd be doing performances at the Kennedy Center and Carnegie Hall. Um, but it wasn't for me. I had some successes, but also a lot of resistance. And after that, I decided, you know, I need to fulfill my childhood dream of being a singer. Opera's not quite the right fit for me, even though I love the music. Uh, I grew to love the music. (laughs) And while I was at opera school in McGill, I was going, I was in opera school by day. And at night I was going out to electronic parties, raves, jazz clubs, Afrobeat concerts, indie shows, metal, like all kinds of stuff. I just love music. And I also studied digital composition there at McGill. And um, so it wasn't for me. I decided, you know, I'm just going to go and pursue my childhood dream of being a singer in New York City. I used to want to be on Broadway, not so much right now, but I fell into singing gypsy jazz through a Craigslist ad, actually. And Speaking of earning money, getting into a niche that, getting into a highly specialized niche is profitable. I fell into profitable situations without, just by virtue of the genre. So if you're not familiar, Gypsy Jazz is hot French jazz from the 30s, created by the legendary guitarist Django Reinhardt. It's featured in Woody Allen films, Um, A lot of people have them at their weddings, a lot of, you know, hot French jazz in jazz clubs, restaurants, bar scenes, concerts, stuff like that. And that became my career in New York City. I was doing gypsy jazz full time and I would do five shows a week, three hour gigs. From my opera training, I never got tired or hoarse because of vocal tech. If you have good technique, you have good technique. grateful for that. And while I was doing that, I a couple of things were happening. One is that I was having financial success there. I attracted patrons, private patrons, in addition to crowdfunding for my music that would support my art without asking for anything in return. And I'm talking about tens of thousands of dollars. And I'm so grateful. There are angels that have come into my life. 
I very lucky, right time, right place. People would stumble into a gig and then it would develop into a beautiful situation. Um, and that was going on. And at the same time, I really wanted to do electronic music. It was tugging at my heart from being in Montreal and I didn't know how to do it. So I then persevered through many interviews to get a position at an audio apprenticeship at a boutique music studio in New York, where I would apprentice under producers who would produce ASAP Rocky and they went double platinum and I was in their sessions and working and not just apprenticing like doing coffee runs and taking out the trash. I would be left alone in the studio for eight hours and they would pass me a project, not these producers, but the head of the studio would pass me projects and say, mix this album, get it back to me. And I was learning as I go. I was in the studio then at night learning on YouTube oh and I'm coming back. And um, I learned a lot and made a lot of great connections. So for that, and then I also created started producing my own original music that combined electronics and jazz. I got artist residencies that were transformative, um, better than the better institutional support than the conservatory for me at Strathmore outside of DC. And um, I started releasing my own original albums and I won awards. And then I would go to France and stay with Romani musicians in their caravans for this gypsy jazz music. And, um, you know, I was doing all of this, but I still felt pulled like one foot in the gypsy jazz, one foot in the original music. And it was stifling my growth because there's two different directions. And then ultimately I decided, what do I really want? And that's to do me. Mm. I love the gypsy jazz music in that community but it wasn't so much like my original music. I was, you know, singing cover songs or that kind of thing, which isn't bad at all. But I mean, I would have gigs at the Rainbow Room at 30 Rock, like scouted to perform there and gigs at the Kennedy Center's Millennium Stage, like great things, um, but come up with a lot of blocks and frustrations. And I would keep myself small because I wasn't sure which path to go. And it was more a question of self-worth more than anything and self-esteem. Mm -hmm. um, and then eventually I was like, you know, I got to make a change. Um, and so then, uh, you know, I, I started teaching more. I mean, I've been teaching music for 15 years now, but I started taking the gypsy jazz off from like the main income and it's like okay I need to free up my time in the evenings for gigs to do my original music so not to do the jazz gigs in the evening because I can't do both so I'll teach during the day free up my time and teach online so I can tour with my original music got mentorship never invested in myself like that before with a life and business coach it changed my life Gina DeVee's her name and um I, uh, long story short, like applied to artist residencies for validation, didn't get into some of them. I got one at Brooklyn Arts Council, but it wasn't this big international one that I wanted. And I'm very grateful for the Brooklyn Arts Council one. But then I said, you know what? I'm tired of playing small, holding myself back. I'm gonna go create my own artist residency in Cuba. And so I created a solo month long retreat in Cuba, wrote and recorded an I wrote an album there, hired a six piece band to record it. I also collaborated with some American filmmakers and music producers that went down to Cuba and we worked with Cuban hip hop artists and I performed with them and collaborated on their albums and a documentary film. So that was incredible. And, um, you know, the next year I was like, how can I top that experience and create something magnificent? Could I had grease on the back of my mind, like, go stay in, on a Greek island for a month. Couldn't think of how to make it happen financially. So I just let it go. Talk about manifesting. I got a phone call out of the blue to volunteer at a refugee camp in Greece with this Broadway film and TV talent and crew and to be the music director. The music director at the time was the director for Mean Girls on Broadway. She had a family emergency, couldn't go through word of mouth, 
I got a call as like knowing this idea of that self-worth and giving your something to yourself. I thought if I, it would mean so much just for me and to be there in a space, if I could help one person out of all of the crises they've been through, through feeling to help feel like a human again, even if it was just for three seconds and like let the world melt away, that would be worth it. I said yes in a heartbeat. Went there, we put on this Arabic production of uh, Shakespeare. They had this Syrian film star that they all knew and loved. And um, it was extraordinary. And then I ended up traveling the Greek islands for two, two weeks after. And, you know, I, and I've, that was another big turning point. It's like just the universe will provide, just go after what you want still. So um, then I decided to further commit to my own original music. I had been producing like and collaborating with other producers, like writing my own song sketches, but not doing all of the, the nitty gritty nuances. And I mean, I'd released four albums at that time and collaborated on others. But um, I then started this collaborative relationship with someone, didn't work out. And I said, you know, I have to produce my own music because I, I didn't feel like I could rely on other people. I, could, I knew I could rely on myself, which is something I'm working through, relying on people, trust, um, but, and, and coming down ultimately to self-trust. But it's been my dream to produce my own music. And so that's what I did. And I hired music mentors for accountability to help me see what I couldn't see with certain production aspects. And now I've been releasing those singles this year. And I released the Cuban jazz album this year because I was sitting on it. And I was like, no more sitting on things, get it out there. I released three singles so far this year, working on a, a few of them more. I ran another crowdfunding campaign to help with this. Um, and that's what's going on now. And, wow. uh, and I that moved like across the country to LA. It's like, no more sitting just do what you want to do that is so much to take in okay I have so many questions um this is really good so I love that you you know you you mentioned to our audience like hey if you're looking to really make money find a genre that's less common and really you became like the person for gypsy jazz you know like you were one of the people that people called on if they wanted it and you just really immersed yourself in that that uh, genre. And I, I really don't even know anything about that genre, which is interesting. I'm sure I've heard it. I just didn't realize it was called that. Um, and, and you, you happened upon it by mistake, but yeah. when you were, you know, then getting really involved with that, were you realizing like, Hey, this is a, this is a, something that I could really, you know, take advantage, not take advantage of, but, you know, like really utilize for my advantage to make income, you know, steadily be, by kind of becoming the, the person, the known person for this. Oh yeah, totally. I was, you know, talking with the booking agents for my friend, Stefan Rambel, who does the Woody Allen soundtracks and performs live at the Grammys. And I was talking with his agent his agent was like, I can help you if you want a tour doing gypsy jazz, we could work together, but you're torn. So you got to make a choice. Mm. So I, yeah, definitely. And so you followed that for a while and it, and, and it sounded like you met a lot of really great people during that time. You had the people that were wanting to be patrons for you and not asking anything in return. Um, how did that, how did that come about? It sounded, it sounded like you didn't even ask from them. Did they, did they offer? Yes, they did. I am so grateful. So there are a number of them and I've also run crowdfunding campaigns with public patronage through those crowdfunding campaigns but with the private patronage um they happened through gigging mm. through gigging um different things like they would tell me they would stumble into a gig and they just really loved the music and we would talk and um and just formed, stayed in contact and 
um, like sometimes at the, oftentimes at the end of gigs, if they would, if I would do a recurring gig at a certain place, they would come up and like slip me 200 bucks at the end of every gig. Mm. Or if I needed money for a project, I would be really nervous to email them, but I would. And then they would say yes. And they would say, send me a project budget. I was like, all right, let me get a project budget together. <laughs> Um, I guess I wasn't that organized at that time. No, most um, artists, they don't, they don't think about that in advance until they realize they need it. So that's one big thing I talk about around crowdfunding is make sure you have the budget. Um, so I would love to know about your, when you did do the public crowdfunding, did you already have like an email list? Did you go out to them first or were you like talking about this at gigs? What was the easiest way to get people on as patrons? Email list. Yep. Definitely. Yeah. Um, and definitely through the email list and then also personal outreach. I hired, I've done four crowdfunding campaigns now, one on Kickstarter, one on Indiegogo, one on GoFundMe, two on Indiegogo. And um, most recently I hired someone to help me uh, to strategize it more. Um, and so we worked with spreadsheets with that. Can I talk about the strategy for that? Yeah, right now? totally. That time? So we would go through strategy months out in advance. This is after you do the budget, um, after you do the creative vision. Well, we talked about a couple things. So creative vision, uh, start with why. People are connecting to the story. Why are you doing something? There's a Simon Sinek, S-I-N-E-K, I forget mm -hmm. how to pronounce his last name, TED Talk, Start With Why, also a book, but why are you doing something? Um, create a meaningful, uh, what's a benefit to the person? Although in crowdfunding, it's not so much like you're selling them product as much as you're selling them like you and your relationship, that kind of thing. They want you to succeed. Mm -hmm. They want to support you. Um, and so there's that. And then I hired a VA to help me get organized, especially with things like shipping costs. So complicated because you have to calculate okay, what are my perks that I'm offering? How am I bundling them together? And what are the costs for shipping this domestically? And then like local internationally for the US and Canada and North America, then internationally. And you have to look at different companies like the USPS, FedEx um, and UPS. And what is the best company to work with depending on the size of the package. So I hired someone to research that for me because then you also have to value your time. How much time is it gonna take you to do that? Mm -hmm. um, and then also in terms of outreach, we created spreadsheets with three circles of influence. One are like your family and friends, your ride or dies, your best friend kind of thing. Um, second circle would be like your gig buddies, your music friends, people that would like, buy you a beer or like buy you a coffee, like something like that where um, the, yeah. And the rider dies also include super fans. Um, and then the third circle the with the greatest number of people are more acquaintances and some friends, but they might not be in a position to support you financially. And it's like, well, just try and organize them. And then, um, her strategy that she was teaching was to have multiple dates of authentic conversations where you have a spreadsheet and you mark the day for when you first reach out months in advance. So you, you can go down a list and keep contact of who you actually reach out to versus going by intuition. What do I totally. Feel that is that? so smart because you're having so many conversations. You're not going to remember. Exactly. And then there's a section for notes if there's anything in particular. Um, so you have that and then you could circle back in the future 
and then you have another column for that and the date that you talked and then the actual emails for crowdfunding ariel hyatt has a great book on i think it's called crowdstart crowdstart i always recommend her book yes yeah and so doing that and then now and then now it's up to fulfillment but, but yeah yeah it's uh, that's great that you did all of that strategizing and figuring out who the people are um that's a lot of the work of it. And it's very smart to hire a VA to do all of that stuff. Because like you said, you know, we only have so much time in the day and you have to value your time for sure. So are you doing a crowdfunding campaign for this current, I know you're releasing singles. Are you doing a crowdfunding campaign for like the full album? I did last year and now I'm fulfilling it. Okay. And what, what are some cool perks that you've offered that people love? Like really even like some of those like high level ones that only a few people get. Certain ones that are successful around the hundred dollar mark. One includes a meditation station. So a cut, an ambient track that I would make and crystals and a journal. I call it the songwriting station. So a little journal because I love journaling um and write a little personalized note in there and you know physical copies of the music of a cd which now i'm kind of like eh. but i guess some people want cds but i don't really personally use them <laughs> but you know some people want them and that's what they want so you give it to them um and then I've done crystal necklaces. In my experience, what sold well for me for merchandise is jewelry, mm. better than music. So even if I'd be in New York City playing an electronic gig at the Warper party, I would have my email list set out, my CDs and merchandise, and then I would have a few little rings. They're double finger rings because they allude to Django Reinhardt and Gypsy Jazz. He lost he had nerve damage in his fingers from a caravan flyer but through that it actually he revolutionized guitar playing mm. to the point that Jimi hendrix called him his idol wow. um so it's this little play on that with the django practice ring it's a double finger ring they would just go like crazy <laughs> um so jewelry works really well uh and then other things that I've offered have been, that have done well, tees and hoodies mm. and just like cool art. And so I have been going through this company called Custom Inc. They have great customer service and I love that about them. They are not, as of right now, I don't think that they're print on demand, but in, in working with them, I was able to work with a designer to get a mock-up of the shirt and hoodie. It's the same art um, and do different color designs because, you know, the more colors that you use, the higher the price of the item would be. Mm -hmm. So that was actually very valuable. And I'm, I stumbled into that and I'm really grateful that I did because um, I can now use that either through large purchases through Custom Inc. or I can do print on demand, having this uh, mock-up already created and use that on my site, like in my online shop, mm. without wow. actually having the physical product for that yet. Very cool. Um, have you offered any perks that aren't physical products? Like, you know, maybe you write a song for someone or you produce a song for someone or you do a private concert. I have, but people haven't bought those. Interesting. Huh? Well, I've actually offered, I've, I've had people, I've had executive producer credits for like thousand and above. Mm -hmm. I say and above because there are different campaigns. Um, one of the private patrons bought those, but yeah, no, I don't know. I guess that comes down to me communicating the value of it. Like I offered my artist coaching, but no one bought it through that. But I mean, that's okay for me because I actually earn more money through direct sales than through Indiegogo taking a fee. That's true. 
Yeah, that is a thing. So do you recommend, like you've done three different crowdfunding uh, platforms? Three platforms, yeah. Yeah, which is there anyone that you like the best or do they, do you feel like they all have different reasons that to like and dislike them? Kickstarter scares me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I like GoFundMe because you're not held to like necessarily fulfill any perk, but it depends on what your people want because the problem with a crowdfunding campaign is that it's a lot of work. And then I look back and I think with all of this time that I've invested, I could have just earned money in some other ways. But it was good because also I was able to get really good target market research for what people buy mm -hmm. and what they want to build merchandise for online sales and for touring. I mean, it's kind of like up and down at the same time. Um, I would run ads for them. Um, and I also saw a friend of mine recently did a crowdfunding campaign through GoFundMe for $6,000 for a, a project. And that was complete. And he doesn't have perks to fulfill because perks to fulfill is also expensive. Yep. It can be. And a lot of time. And, and if you're doing this for an album, and then you got to focus on, okay, I'm releasing the album and I'm promoting it and all that stuff. And you also have to fulfill your perks that can get overwhelming. Yeah. So, and so I guess, you know, the question is figuring out like how important are perks to your audience or do they just want to support you? Exactly. Right. Exactly. And then also thinking with what you said, and then also what perks that I, could I create that would have a return in the future? like the mock-ups for the shirts, hmm. buy these shirts, now I can sell them at gigs or the jewelry, now I can sell those at gigs. Yeah, that's really, really smart. So you're in LA, what is your, what is your plan moving forward? I mean, you are obviously going all in on your own music and yeah. you're, you're performing under the artist name Alark. Mm -hmm. And is it, is it electronica? Like what's the style? Yeah, it's electronic dance pop. Okay. It's like James Blake meets Charlie XEX mm. meets Grimes, but with a little bit more jazzy flavor to it, a little bit. Interesting. Okay, awesome. Um, and then I, I saw that you have a workshop that you're doing. So I'd love to hear about that as well. Yes, one of my greatest passions is helping other emerging and professional female artists in pop and electronic music find their own signature sound and their true voice, because I get it. And I've been wanting help for this for so long. Could have help in singing or songwriting or music business, but never really could put them together. Um, and so I created what I was looking for. And I coach other artists Again, I've been teaching for 15 years, but in the past few years, I've kind of packaged this up. And the workshop that I'm holding right now, it's a free workshop. It's, you can go to findyoursignaturesound.com and we go through 10 steps to writing songs that you love, that are authentic to you and that you can use for building your music career. I also have a lot of new exciting things with the artist coaching platform. I recently launched a group program by recently, I mean, two days ago, mm -hmm. uh, and it's, <laughs> it's going to be in May and June. So depending on the timing of this podcast, um, I'm not sure if it will be relevant. However, I'm going to be running this program continuously in the future and I'm thrilled about it. It's an accelerator combining the singing, songwriting, music business for branding and finding what makes you create your own niche. So even if you wanna do something in pop music, which is such a broad field, it's finding what makes you stand out and how to communicate your message in that as well. And also the personal growth and spiritual elements that are crucial for getting out of your own way. Mm. So um, that is at setyourlifetomusic.com slash signature sound. And I also have a new branding unveiling that is 
happening right now, but I can't really say more about that yet. <laughs> Well, uh, it's it's a supreme sound dot life. That's I mean it's not up, but I'm there's a designer. That, I mean the business was registered last the the branding was registered last night even so, but it's at supreme sound dot life. Awesome, lots of exciting things happening for you. I love hearing your metamorphosis. You know, as an artist, gosh, going from that's crazy opera to uh, gypsy jazz to electronic pop, like. Wow, that's really awesome. It just shows what a versatile artist you are and multi-passionate. So um, for anyone that wants to connect with you on social media, how can they do that? Come join me on uh, Instagram at alark, A-L-A-R-K-E underscore. And you can also go to supremesound.life at Instagram. I have a mailing list. It's awesome i have a facebook community at set your life to music that's going to be rebranded to supreme sound life but it's awesome we have hundreds of high vibe female artists lots of free trainings and support and yeah would love to be in touch love it love it thank you so much for sharing all of this it's such an interesting and really cool journey. And I appreciate all of your tips on the crowdfunding, getting into the nitty gritty of all of the strategies and stuff. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at profitablemusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.